Welcome to PCB Chat, where we talk with experts across the printed circuit design, manufacturing, and electronic supply chain fields. I'm Mike Buto, the president of the PCEA. Today's podcast is sponsored by PCB East and the Ultra HDI Forum, Engineering Tomorrow's Electronics. Join engineers and designers this June in the Boston suburbs for more than 75 hours of technical presentations and an exhibition featuring 65 leading companies from across the print circuit design to assembly supply chain. Visit the website at pcbeast.com for information. Today, we welcome back Audrey McGuckin, with whom we spoke about four years ago. Audrey spent 22 years with Jabel in a variety of roles, culminating as vice president and chief talent officer. She has lived and worked across the globe with assignments in Singapore, China, Taiwan, Japan, the U.S., Germany, France, and Spain. Seven years ago, she founded Audrey McGuckin Leadership Solutions, where she consults with CEOs and CHROs to solve complex business challenges through innovative talent and people solutions. Welcome back, Audrey. Ah, uh, thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure. One of the interesting things to me about the McGuckin Group is that you conduct surveys that help drive their their businesses. And when we last spoke, you had been interviewing chief executives about work-related issues. And perhaps not surprisingly, they said number one was talent acquisition. Even despite the layoffs that have been announced um, of late by some high-profile companies, unemployment rates, especially in the tech sector, are hovering around the high 3% mark, maybe even a little bit lower in our industry. So I'm guessing that talent acquisition is still the number one issue among um, executives today. And that would, that would be a good guess, but maybe not 100%. And what I would say, Mike, is... One of the things that we help organizations do at the McGuckin Group is we help them grow their business. Specifically, we help them grow their business with the number one barrier to entry, which is talent and leadership. Often, people think about that as just talent acquisition. But one of the things that, that we do as an organization is we, we look at it around what we call the six Bs. What I mean by that is, what talent do you need to buy, which is talent acquisition? What talent do you need to build, which is developing leadership talent? What talent do you need to bind, which is retaining your top talent? You know, what talent do you need to bounce, which is what talent do you need to exit? Um, so there, there, there's what I would say is, it's not so much now about talent acquisition, but it's more about the employee life cycle. Um, and, and specifically what we're seeing is if organizations have top talent that are really connected with their customer, they do not want to lose that talent. They, they do not want to lose that talent. So I think it's, it's broader now, Mike, than when we perhaps first talked. Well, let's um, let's tug on that leadership thread for a moment. Um, so, would that? How far down the org chart would that go? Um, is that just focused on the C level suites, or are you looking at the uh, middle management level as well? Mm. And I love that question. And and here's how we think about it: the jobs that are at the intersection of strategy and execution are middle managers. Those are the guys and gals that really have to make it happen, right? They're, they're on the front line. And so when we talk about talent and we talk about building leadership capability, certainly there's work to do at the top tier. But we think where the money's at is at this middle manager level, which is, you know, boots on the ground and connecting with, with the, the biggest broadest section of the, the people in your organization and and they're responsible for connecting your big audacious goals to execution and it's those middle managers that are so important. And when we're talking about the middle management, you know, is is part of what you're doing helping leadership pinpoint who in that group are 
the best candidates to take to the next level? Or is it broader than that, where you're, you're advising them on how to grow all of their staff, really, you know, to the level that, that they may be capable of? Yes. I think, let's think about the six Bs again. One of the, the six Bs is how do we build our talent? So how do you build leadership capability at that middle manager level? Another one of the Bs is how do you boost your talent? So trying to identify who are the highest potential middle managers that we think can make it to the next level. And so there's there's different strategies for, for, for different groups of employees. But here's the kicker. The kicker is what is your business strategy? Are you trying to enter new markets? Are you trying to grow in certain segments? Are you trying to grow in certain geographies? And on the basis of that, that's how you really define your talent strategy. Talent strategy might seem like a big word or two big words, but it's really about what are the tactics that we're going to deploy with our talent? So you really do start with the organization's business objectives. Yes, always. And... We're pretty crazy about that. We, we hate to do work that's um, in isolation of the business strategy because what's the point? That, you know, we, we're, we're really trying to create this line of sight to say, what is the point? And we know that executives and leaders, they're short on time, they're short on budget, and so they want to differentiate. And so how you differentiate is on the basis of your business strategy. There was a business professor at Harvard, he may still be there, uh, named, I believe it was David Kaplan, who uh, wrote a book now, oh my God, it must have been 15 years ago now, it was quite a while. But one of the things he looked at as part of his research was how organizations communicate internally. And he did a number of surveys among uh, publicly traded companies because those are ones where you can easily look at the the profits and the and the and the revenues and things like that and compare them. What he found were that organizations that did the best job of taking the message from the, um, the, the you know the goals or strategies that were as articulated and known to the top level management and communicating that down to the bottom level. The, the folks who are, you know, answering the phones and, and, you know, shipping product out the door, you know, all the way, you know, through the, the chain. The better those organizations were at ensuring that the folks at the bottom understood what their role was in terms of achieving the, the overall business objectives, the better the companies performed, you know, on the basis of revenues, revenue growth and, and profitability. So my question is, do you, as part of your process, do you actually help executives articulate that message uh, throughout the organization? Yes. It's one of the things that we insist on. Often, you know, Mike, we get brought in and the CEO will say, I need help with talent management. And often actually what they need help with is aligning on the strategy and cascading that and creating line of sight throughout the organization. I love to use a couple of examples. One example is Harley Davidson, where there was a consultant went in and, and talked to some of the seamstresses and the, 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 the folks on the, the shop floor. And they said, what do you do? And they said, we sew the jackets that help save people's lives. And you see, that's the that's this idea of line of sight. And then the other example is NASA, right? And, and when you go in and you talk to the janitors and you say, what do you do? And they say, we, we take away the trash and we clean up around here so that we can send people to the moon. And when you can create that line of sight for people in your organization, then you get momentum. Then, then you get people moving in the right direction. Then it has a direct impact on top line sales and EBITDA and margins and whatever else is you're, you're chasing. But having that line of sight to say, what am I doing? And how does it directly correlate to what the organization needs to do? 
I love that term, line of sight. Has the subject of artificial intelligence come up in any of your recent conversations? And if so, what was the context and how is it affecting the decision-making at the sea level? And where would line of sight fit into all that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I don't think, I don't think we've, we've quite figured that out. Um, you know, it's interesting. We had a, a session um, yesterday with Microsoft and we were talking about AI and we were really talking about one of the things they do is they have a gamification process in Microsoft. One of their AI products is Copilot. And they have a competition, if you call it, or a gamification to say how many of our people are actually using our own product, which is Copilot. Um, and so I don't know if that directly answers your question, Mike. I think I think people haven't really figured it out. But here's what I would tell you is AI is important, but what's really important is the human interaction. What's really important is the stories. And AI can't tell those stories. And AI can't can't really enter into that emotional space. They can give you data, they can give you EBITDA, they can give you profit, they can give you supply chain number, they can give you all of that. But they can't connect emotionally at an a, on an AI level. And, and you know, that's what we talk about from a leadership perspective is the capabilities for leaders that's in short supply and high demand are capabilities like empathy, capabilities like vulnerability, capabilities like courage, and you don't get any of them from AI. So um, we're going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but the artificial intelligence conversation could probably be a podcast on its own, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, but I have other things I want to talk about. Um, but hold that, hold that thought. Um, so M&A activity among electronics companies is at a 20-year peak. And those events can be very challenging and anxiety-provoking to employees, of course. Is there particular advice that you provide to executives, and in particular those in the HR profession, about how to handle the inevitable merging of cultures in a way that might be sensitive to all involved. Yeah, and you know we ha- we had a we had a workshop on this um, last week where we talked about um, transformation. We talked about change management, and we talked about M and A. Here's the here's the thing, Mike. You can go on to ChatGPT. You can go on to Copilot. You can go on to Google. And you can search um, 10 best processes for M&A, 10 best processes for um, whatever it is, right? But, but here's, here's the kicker and here's the thing that makes a difference is the human aspect of how you lead through that change. What, what I've experienced um, over many decades and, you know, I supported a lot of acquisitions and mergers in Europe and then I supported a lot of acquisitions in in Taiwan and the number one thing is what I would say is leading with empathy what I mean by that is how do you walk in the shoes of others so for the company that's being acquired how do you how do you take a step back you know, it's typically people that are leading these M&A um, projects are hard chargers, they're highest day profiles, but they want to get things done. But actually what makes the difference is can you walk in the shoes of others? Can you walk in the shoes of those on the other side of the deal and really think through how they're feeling, what some of their fears are, what some of the threat receptors are? Because when we have the threat receptors in our brain, we go into fight or flight mode. And often often that's that's not part of what's talked about in the project plan for M&A deal. We'll, we'll go through supply chain, we'll go through engineering, we'll go through HR, we'll go through all of those things. But very rarely do we talk about the human side. And one of the things we're famous for at the McGuckin Group is being human-centered, which means walking in the shoes of others. 
Now, you did an acquisition of your own a couple of years ago. How much of what you have learned and and put together as part of your own uh, strategic advice were you able to put into practice? And maybe what lessons, if any, did you learn from your experience? Yeah. Again, a great question, Mike. And, you know, one of the, the first things that we we did is we, we said, as soon as the deal closed, we said, let's not make any moves until we talk to the end users. Let's not make any moves and, until we talk to the people on the receiving end. And, and let's ask them how they're feeling. Let's ask them what their greatest fears are. Let's ask them what they're most excited about. And then how do we... How do we create an integration plan where they feel, they feel part of the family? I think one of the biggest mistakes that, that people make in acquisitions is they focus on the transactional versus on the human side. We, we did a lot of things like we did happy hours. We, we did a lot of social events. We connected with the, the, the people and we connected with the customers on the other side. I know you asked me that that there were any mistakes that we made. And I think one of the mistakes is we knew that to be true. We maybe never moved fast enough and we didn't do that right at the front end. And so we try to do it early, but doing it even even earlier, I think, would would have made a difference. Interesting. We're always learning, of course. You mentioned a moment ago about uh, some workshops that you produced. Um, How often do you do these and who would you expect to come? Ah, yes. We have what we call workshops every month. And one of the reasons we do that is to build community. And, And we invite CEOs, we invite um, executives, we invite VPs. We try and keep it at that, that higher level for those workshops. And we, we make them very interactive. And we, we talk about, you know, challenges that they're facing. And, and we share some thought leadership. The, the, the biggest reason we, we actually do them is to share thought leadership and to create peer learning opportunities. Why do I say that? Um, when, when I was with Jabel, um, I had the opportunity for five years to collaborate with Harvard Business School. And we, we took our executives in the spring and the fall every year for five years. Um, and we had the best professors um, that you could think about in the world participate in those sessions. But when we did the evaluation of what did you find most valuable, what those executives said was the peer learning, the peer-to-peer learning. And and that really stuck with me, this idea of we learn from each other. We don't learn from necessarily a keynote and we don't necessarily learn from uh, professors, but actually where the learning takes place is through peer learning. And so one of the reasons we do these workshops is to create peer learning opportunities. And I'm so grateful for a lot of our clients and a lot of our community who who share, here's the biggest mistake I made, and I wish I hadn't done that, or here's one of the things I did, and it proved to be exceptional. And when people can hear that in real stories, it's powerful. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Uh, in, in fact, that is the same thing that we've experienced with, with all of our professional events. It doesn't matter how high profile the speakers who come in. I mean, that might get somebody through the door, but once they're there... Time and time again, they say what they really want is more time just to talk with their peers. Yes, because think about the think about the intelligence and the experiences in the room when you when you get some some really incredible leaders together and 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 sharing that is so powerful. So anytime we do a workshop, Mike, we we typically have what we call a schema, which is rules of thumb, which is um If it's a one-hour workshop, we typically do 15 minutes on keynote, and we do 45 minutes on peer learning. And these are done in person or via Zoom? Uh, These are done virtually. The reason they're done virtually is because most of our network and client base is spread across the globe. So 
it's difficult for us to include our, our Asia um, executives, um, but we tend to do it at lunchtime. That means that we can capture Europe and California and um, the East Coast. So we, we do them virtually. And so inside of that type of an environment, how do the attendees um, talk to each other as opposed to just being, um, I, I'd say, you know, sort of lectured to by the speaker? We we have kind of some special sauce that we use, and um, I'm getting a little bit technical now, but when we first have people come in the room, we have them go and chat. So that's the first time that they interact, and we ask them how they're doing. The second thing we do is we do a poll, and that's the second way that they interact is through a poll. The third thing that we do is we, you know, we ask people to raise their hands, Sometimes what we'll do is breakout rooms and we'll do smaller um, sessions and then we bring them back into the main auditorium online mm-hmm. and we have, a, we have a conversation. So we have a pretty unique way of creating psychological safety where people feel like they can talk. Right, right. Because that is harder, I think, to do you know, online where you don't necessarily know who else is listening and and what their motivations are and all that. Congratulations on coming up with a a way to overcome that barrier, right? (laughs) How would somebody participate in this? Yeah, they can go to our website, which is www.mcguckengroup.com. The other thing that they can do is send me an email, audrey at mcguckengroup.com. And we'll get you on our mailing list and um, you'll see some of the topics that are coming up. It's things like change management. It's barriers to entry. It's building human-centered leadership. Um, really topics that are top of mind. And, you know, we, we try and poll our community. No, we don't try and poll our community. We poll our community and we ask them, what do you want to hear about in the, in the coming quarter and what, what's top of mind for you? And what I would say is, Every time the thing that's top of mind is talent, leadership, and people. And it's, and it's some variation of that. So, you know, a few moments ago, we talked a bit about uh, the, the capabilities, right? The empathy, the courage, the vulnerability. The, there are several notable colleges that are undergoing near crises on their campuses as students and faculties and administrations wrestle with whether to or even how to respond to events that are taking place far from home, in particular in the Middle East. Now, I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on that specifically, of course. Uh, Thank you. Right. <laughs> A while back in your blog, uh, which is on your website, you spoke to another complexity that many businesses had to understand and develop ways to address, which was DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So all of the encampments aside, do you see parallels between what's happening today on college campuses and the DEI programs and the business environments in terms of the strategies that business leaders could use to address them and perhaps the lack of a playbook for doing so? Mm, What a complex question. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But But I really think that you, like, I don't want to you know, preempt your answer. But I mean, I think that you kind of hinted at it towards, you know, a little while ago with some of these leadership capabilities that you stress. Yes. Yes. And, you know, there's there's the phrase of DEI, which is diversity, equity and inclusion. And what we like to focus on at the McGuckin Group is inclusion. And the reason we like to focus there is because we think that's directly correlated to leadership. And the the next connection point is, as a leader, how do you create an environment where everybody feels included? How do you create an environment where everybody feels like they can contribute? And we think that the number one way to do that is empathy. And empathy is walking in the shoes of others. I've said that before. And so... How as how as leaders, how as leaders do we do that? And that is not easy. But one of the ways you do it is we think is to create platforms for storytelling, to create platforms that, are, that allow leaders to tell their stories. Um, 
we I'm going to get practical with you, Mike, now for a, for a minute, but we use a process of sharing your story in six images. And that's different to saying, here's my LinkedIn. And it's different to saying, here's my website. And it's different to saying, here's my ethnicity or, or here any of those things. But what are the stories that shaped your life? And, um, you know, we were um, working with a company and in, in headquartered in Taiwan and we had a lot of feedback from some folks that said to us, oh my goodness, that's going to be difficult for um, white female leaders to connect with 60-something-year-old Taiwanese leaders. And here's what I would tell you is we never we never stumbled for a moment because we so believe in, in what we do. And I told my story in six images and our CFO, Catherine Sherman, told her story in six images. And, and then we asked the CEO of our client to, to pick an image and tell his story. And I can tell you that there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And so when we can connect on a personal level, and when we can connect through stories, we can break through barriers that no other people can break through. I'm just going to let that sink in for a moment. That was a really elegant answer. Thank you. I mean, I've been struggling with how to position myself in all of this, and that's a, a, a very nice way to put it. Mike, let's talk about that for a minute, right? One of the the interesting things is my six images is my first image is a newspaper clipping from um, 40 years ago. I'm trying to work out <laughs> my age. It's a newspaper clipping from 40 or 45 years ago. And I grew up in uh, a small mining village in Scotland that had a thousand people. And the newspaper clipping was about a three-year-old girl who had been um, found dead. And the dilemma was, you know, there was two girls babysitting her and then there was a farmhand who had learning disabilities that it was eventually convicted for um, the murder of the three-year-old girl. But at that time, I was 10 years old and... There, there, there was a lot of um, debate around whether that was true or not. And so I ended up being a pen pal to a convicted murderer when I was 10 years old for five or six years. And I look back on that and I think, goodness, why did my parents allow me to do that? And one of the, the things that I realized is I'm so committed to what I think is the right thing to do. And so that image tells the story on part of my leadership. Another one of my images is my daughter, Emily. And when you see the image, she's happy and joyful. And yet Emily suffers from depression and anxiety and had suicidal thoughts. And the reason I share that image is because we have a mental health crisis um, in the world that we live in today. And, and when you can be vulnerable and when you can share your story, the person on the other end feels like they can, they can tell their story. So that, that was perhaps a long answer to your, your question, Mike, but wanted to provide a little bit of color to that. No, but it's, it's very human, right? And, and I think that you know, what I'm hearing is that these are ways that folks in different positions within the organization can break down any barriers, whether they be um, perceived or, or real, um, in terms of background, education, socioeconomic status, you know, you name it, right? Because it, it can be intimidating, I think, for somebody at the lower level to talk to somebody that, you know, hey, look, they're in the papers, they're a billionaire. Like, you know, how do I have that conversation? What, why would they even care what I think? And vice versa. I mean, I could imagine that folks that are talking with Wall Street every day and meeting with, you know, with Bill Gates or, or you know, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or something like that might say, well, like, I can't talk to somebody who's, you know, making $25,000 working in the mailroom because the last thing they want to do is hear from me. Like, it's just going to come across as pedantic or whatever. And yet it has to happen, right? Yes. 
And what I would say to you is it has to happen, but the leader owns it. The mm-hmm. leader at the highest level owns it. Um, and, you know, if we if we think about um, Satya, uh, Microsoft, and, you know, what, what Satya went through with his son, um, Zane had cerebral palsy. And that was one of the moments where Satya really developed empathy. And and Satya as the CEO of Microsoft is, is now known for being one of the most empathetic leaders that that exists in, in the world today. And and he would he would tell you that that was a learned skill and it was a learned capability that that he had to learn, you know, as 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 part of his career. But it was it was something that that was important to him. So not everyone, of course, has a compelling family background story to share. But I'm guessing that one of the things you can do um, as part of your service is to help them find points of empathy where you can kind of connect with the folks around you. Exactly. You know, we um, we were just working with a leader at um, Cardinal Health, and you know, he's he's a pretty senior executive and he said when I first created my six images they were very transactional and he said through working with the McGuckin group I learned to be more vulnerable and I learned to dig deeper and I learned to really think about what do I want to be courageous enough to share and it can be from small things to to really large things but it's here's the kicker that it's it has to be deeply personal. So this is why I bring people like Audrey on this podcast is because they they so challenge my set ways of thinking and all that. So this is <laughs> and this is conversation has gone in ways that I never would have predicted. Um, so thank you for all that. I feel a little guilty now transitioning to the the commercial I have to do, which is to remind listeners that the podcast is sponsored by PCB East and the Ultra HDI Forum. Visit PCBEast.com for information. So that seems really out of place right now. So, okay. So I'm going to end on a more straightforward question. Are the Rays going to win the uh, division this year? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, so that folks who don't understand where this is coming from uh, can can pick up on it. Uh, do you want to explain your your ties to the Tampa Bay Rays? You know, we actually did some some I'm based here in St. Petersburg in Florida. And as we were launching our business, we we actually did some work with the, the Tampa Bay Rays. We did some work with them on leadership. We did some work with them on empathy. And um, as I came to Tampa Bay 25 years ago from Scotland, and when I put my feet on the tarmac in Tampa Airport, I knew this was going to be home. So this has a really special place in my heart, and that's my connection. Great. Well, that brings us to a close to today's episode. I want to thank my guest, Audrey McGuckin of the McGuckin Group, and uh, I hope that uh, folks who are interested will reach out to her. For PCB Chat, this is Mike Buto. Have a nice day.